We also have alumni and friends from firms in Fort Wayne and Indianapolis here tonight, so welcome. Our speakers tonight come from two internationally significant design firms. Adam Greenspan, on my left, has been the lead designer for PWP, Landscape Architecture, on a wide range of projects, including public parks, campuses, mixed-use developments, competitions, and estates. Adam's background in art and sociology, combined with years of horticultural practice, support an integrated approach to design and allows him to develop projects from many angles. Adam has collaborated extensively with architects, artists, community groups, and public and private owner groups, as well as sub-consultant experts in the process of realizing exceptional built work. Adam received a Bachelor of Arts in Studio Art and Sociology from Wesleyan University and a Master in Landscape Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Mark Shoemaker represents the firm of Pelly Clark Pelly Architects and has led the design of commercial, healthcare, transportation, and research projects and was the principal in charge of For Salesforce Transit Center, a 1.5 million square foot multimodal transportation center in San Francisco that is the first new high-speed rail station in the United States. He has led design teams for airports in New Orleans, Winnipeg's first LEED certified airport in Canada, and the design-winning Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. He received a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies from Georgia Institute of Technology and a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. In this centennial year for this university, our college has both reflected on the past and also projected into the future. Part of that future for design, planning, and building professions is the increasing significance of collaborative, interdisciplinary work. We targeted these two firms not only because they represent a body of award-winning work, but also because they have collaborated on a complex and challenging project that cuts across disciplines and societal issues. Mark and Adam will present their work and collaboration on the Salesforce Transit Center and Park. The design of this multimodal transit hub was conceived for and selected from an international competition in 2007. Through years of collaborative development with an expert design team and many local stakeholders and agencies, the project developed um, uh, as a highly integrated hybrid facility. Opened in 2018, the building and its 5.4 acre roof park are much more than a bus or train station, but are in fact the center of a new neighborhood and new community in San Francisco. Outdoor and indoor community spaces, experiences with nature, art, and local ecology have all made, been made available to the general public and Salesforce Transit Center's users. The title of the talk is A New Paradigm for Urban Design, Public Transit, neighbor, Neighborhood, and Visionary Architecture and Landscape. Please welcome Mark Shoemaker and Adam Greenspan. Thank you, Dave. I hope everyone can hear me. I think I'm plugged in. <laughs> Um, well, as you can tell by the title of the talk, and I, I'd like to think of it more of a talk than a lecture, um, it is more than just putting a large bus station and San Francisco's tallest building in the middle of the city. It's much more than that, and we, we understood that from the very beginning. We wanted this building and this complex of buildings to really create a new neighborhood for this part of San Francisco. It was a part of San Francisco that had been laying fallow for many decades mainly because of the way the old transit station was designed and the roadways and ramps that uh, were attached to it that led to the Bay Bridge. And so when this project came along, it really gave everyone in the city of San Francisco and us as designers the opportunity to really reshape uh, this part of San Francisco and to really start examining higher density, uh, multi-use, multi-use buildings, uh, and more green space as a way to really act as a catalyst for a whole new part of San Francisco. So this is the building and the, uh, and the station. 
The tall building is the Salesforce Tower, and the transit station is also named after Salesforce. It was generously given money to it, so they both uh, have that label. And that is the 5.4 acre park uh, that uh, Dave mentioned, uh, and Adam's going to go into that in great detail. But it, and it's more than just one park, which is another significant part of this. And from the very beginning, we wanted to create something for that roof. We always thought of that station as having this fifth facade. It needed to do something more than was traditional. And as you'll learn as we get into this, the idea of the park emerged early on in the competition process. And I should also say that you know, a project of this magnitude and this length of time requires a huge team of engineers, architects, specialists, uh, and consultants of all type. So Adam and I are standing up here representing really a large team that has really dedicated themselves to this job over at least 12 years, and it goes on. The original station was actually a train station, but it then became a bus station. It was never anything really remarkable architecturally. It was of a WPA vintage, 1939. It had some nice details, but it was uh, very tired and underutilized and under maintained by the time we got there in 2007. And you can see here just the nature of it. Frankly, nothing terrible or wrong. It did its job, but it wasn't uh, the right size, certainly for the 21st century, and it couldn't really be reused. So the idea was to take it down. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, had this tail of this ramp system that led to the Bay Bridge. And you can start to see it here, and it really provide, uh, prevented a lot of sites from being properly developed. And so leaving this area of San Francisco uh, really uh, empty of any real true development. And you can see in the next slide, you know, a lot of the neighborhoods were having to deal with this kind of architecture and engineering just running through the streets, uh, really not doing anything uh, to help the, the growth of the city. And this diagram here starts to show you the difference. Um, the upper right is the old diagram. And you can see how it just slices through huge swaths of the city. Whereas down below, to the left, it freed up the new system, which gives us a very direct ramp to the Bay Bridge, really freed up a lot of property. A lot of it owned by the TJPA, allowing them to also uh, sell that land for revenue to pay for the station. So it was a win-win situation, both urbanistically and financially. And it opened up all sorts of sites for development, a lot of it mixed use, a lot of housing. Last count, there were close to 7,000 new residential units, millions of square feet of new uh, commercial space, a lot of retail that goes with that as well, a lot of it connected to the transit station. Uh, the intent has always been for the 5.4 acre park to be linked to all the base of buildings adjacent to it. So all of that is really starting to gel, uh, which is really wonderful to see. Uh, despite this building going through at least three, we count them, economic cycles where at times we weren't sure it was going to get built at all. So it's really quite remarkable in that regard. And then if this will work, you'll start to see how that development has started to evolve in a more graphic way. Uh, the station is in the middle there, and the white buildings that you see appearing are just some of the buildings that have been built or are going to be built uh, in the next five years. So from an urban design point of view, that is remarkable in terms of the timeline in our experience. But with the high-tech boom going on in San Francisco and San Francisco real estate uh, being sky high in terms of uh, energy and pricing, uh, this is all happening because of that. And now that we've given this land back to development, it's right for the dollar. So that's just a snapshot of the area around the station with the Transbay Transit Center uh, in the center there, which will be the tallest building in the city. And there's a more graphic and sort of in-situ shot of that. Um, just a note on the, on the tower, uh, this became the poster child, if you will, for the San Francisco Planning Department to create the first thousand foot high tower in San Francisco. This is part of an overall strategy to really release the building heights in San Francisco, which up to this point, we're at 700 feet, so we're 300 feet above the tallest building there currently, or was there, uh, which was Transamerica, which is the uh, 
pyramidal building you see in the distance and the Bank of America building, which is partially hidden. But you can see how the, the new Salesforce Tower will really, really establish the uh, San Francisco skyline in a very dramatic way. Now, the competition is held in 2007. Uh, HKS uh, had done the master plan for the Trans Bay uh, Joint Powers Authority, who was the client. Um, and their initial vision of this tower, of the, well, the tower and the station, primarily the station, was to deal with the roof of the station as a glass roof. A very logical way to proceed. Uh, it could have gone in any number of ways. But once again, we, we realized early on that that seemed to be an underwhelming solution to this problem, given how embedded the building was in the city and the possibilities that we could do with the roof, and that's where the uh, roof part, rooftop part came into play. Uh, that would have multiple ways of getting up to it from the street, and would serve as a catalyst park for this neighborhood uh, to really launch it into the next century. And so the cross section of the of the uh, of the station is what you see here, and what it features is a device that we used in the competition. There are more of them in the competition, but through various, like, for various reasons, some of them cost. Um, we ended up doing one larger one in the Grand Hall, uh, which uh, was penned by the newspapers as the central, uh, the Grand Central uh, of, of the West. Uh, we had always wanted to create a very grand um, station, uh, lobby, uh, not unlike the tradition of old railroad stations, uh, as a gateway structure to the city. And the light column provided that in terms of not only bringing light, but also structuring the skyline and creating a memorable, iconic entry and space for that grand hall. So looking at the station itself, it's a very long, narrow building. It's about 1,600 feet long, about 150 feet wide. Uh, it's almost like an aircraft carrier. It's, it's, it's a rather large building. It's about 50 feet tall on average, 65 at one end, 70 at another. Uh, it has a ground floor, it has a mezzanine, it has a bus deck level, and the rooftop. It's also designed with a uh, train box below grade, which will house the high speed rail coming from Los Angeles eventually. The box is built, but it's empty at the moment, waiting for funding in the future. Uh, and then the base of the building was carefully articulated to avoid some of the estates, some of the unfortunate developments happening at other bus stations around the country. We couldn't help but look at the Port Authority bus terminal in New York, which is close to us. And for those of you who had the misfortune of having gone there, uh, you'll know what I mean. It does not relate to the street. It killed and separated two neighborhoods rather dramatically when it was built. And it's really just a very bad place to be. And so urbanistically, we wanted to avoid all those traps. So we lifted the, ele you know, the elevation of the building, the, the facade of the building, to expose a very glassy interior with a large retail component, along with the grand hall, as I spoke. And we also made it extremely poor. So movement north-south, and that's north-south relative to this plan, uh, was facilitated uh, everywhere that we could, including two streets that passed underneath it, so that one can move from this district to the financial district, which is directly north of us, with ease, and also taking into account other alleys that were already in place uh, to the north of us, uh, to really embed this building carefully into the streetscape. And then above all of this, we have the bus deck itself, uh, which allows for 36 buses to berth. And you can see at the very left-hand corner there, the, the ramp that leads to the Bay Bridge. Uh, very simple connection that goes straight to the bridge. And then you come in and you rotate around the building with its various berths. And then all the core escalators, stairs, and the Grand Hall, which is the large sort of squash racket shape you see in the middle there, takes you down into the Grand Hall. So all of this is visible, and then as you look up through the skylights, you also see the park. So there's great transparency, not only at street level, but also vertically through the building, 
not only to bring light, but also to advertise the park, bring that into focus uh, very clearly. And with that, as we did so often during the design process, I'm going to hand it over to Pat to talk a little bit about the park, and we'll move on from there. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> I'm going to jump back for one second, because this is going to come up later. Uh, so, as Mark pointed out, the buses that come from the Bay Bridge, which come from the East Bay in San Francisco, drive above the city streets on this ramp, and they come into this bus deck level, which is one level below the park. And they drive around this way and pull into these bays, and then continue driving around and then back to go out. Um, so that plays into our collaborative project, and we'll come back to that later. But I think at the time when we started the competition, which was a design competition, uh, really we wanted to look at the neighborhood and what really wasn't yet a neighborhood. It was really just a part of San Francisco that was uh, sort of a industrial part of San Francisco uh, and uh, an area with remnants of the bridges and ramps that Mark showed in those early photos of the area. And when we mapped that part of downtown, we found that uh, the largest green spaces were these uh, marked here. And as far as the people in San Francisco felt, uh, this area was far away from Union Square or Yerba Buena Gardens or South Park. But the size of all, all of those green spaces, those public plazas and public parks, if you added up the area, equaled the area that we had on the roof of the transit center. So what we proposed was not only would this be the fifth side of the building that people looking down from those tall, tall towers would see, um, but that this also was an active and usable part of the outdoor space in the city. And we looked at a couple other precedents in San Francisco um, to uh, sort of shape our thinking about how we would develop the park. One was Golden Gate Park, and while it's uh, much, much, much bigger than our site, you'll see that its orientation and its uh, disposition is similar. It's very long and skinny. Uh, and what is true about it is that it changes, there's a sequence of experiences through this big park, this regional park, as you move uh, from east to west, where you touch the city, we have the urban experiences, the places where you have big concerts, music concerts that connect to the city streets. There's a carousel, there's uh, play fields and a kid's playground, and um, all that kind of uh, intensive use. As you move west, uh, you go through the cultural spaces of uh, museums, then to more natural gardens and uh, native planting areas, until you meet the beach, you know, at the far western end. What we also had here uh, were a number of neighborhood parks with cities where the neighborhoods and residential areas were built up around them after the parks were established early in some cases. And so people used those parks as uh, the neighborhood gathering place or the neighborhood green uh, in the center of places that weren't necessarily residential prior to the establishment of the park. And we thought about both of those things um, as well as San Francisco's Victorian heritage, Victorian architecture, um, as well as a Victorian attitude towards collecting plants as sort of the cornerstones of what we would develop in the park. And these images are of um, <coughs> Victorian glass houses. The Crystal Palace is one of them in England that actually, uh, the Conservatory of Flowers, which is one of the buildings in the cultural part of Golden Gate Park, was modeled after. And during the Victorian era, uh, collecting plants from all over the world and displaying them was something that happened. And so we decided to focus on these things, creating a park, a long skinny park, um, that uh, offers an experience as you move through it, um, creating a park that could be the center of a new community, and then finally um, making a botanical and horticultural story part of the uh, experience and the educational experience that you could get when you go to this park. Um, but here we wanted to focus on plants that were specifically suited to our climate, things that you didn't need to grow inside of a glass house, but plants that you would grow outside that wouldn't need additional water or additional irrigation plants that would be fitted to the Mediterranean climate that we have. And so looking at this cross-section, which Mark showed, 
When you come into the Grand Hall, you get views all the way up to the park. And what we wanted to do was take all of these moments, and we worked these out during the competition and then after, moments where you get views up through the building, through a skylight, and you would actually see three-dimensional space defined by the plants. You would see people moving up there, so that people that were on the ground level, which is 70 feet uh, or 60, uh, below uh, the park level, would always be able to see that there was activity and a place to go. And so you can see the, the cross-section here, uh, and you can see the other skylights uh, that are on the park. This is the skylight above the Grand Hall that we were looking at. In addition to that pop-up light column, there's also a flush skylight that um, is at the plaza level on the park that is glass paving, basically. And so all of these ways meant that people who are walking around the, the station would be able to see from a distance that there's a public space above, as well as from inside the building. And you can see here that these buildings gathered around this park, and this really has become, in a much shorter time frame than we expected, the center of a new developing uh, neighborhood. And as part of the competition concepts, we put forth this idea that this park could be highly programmed, that there should be a schedule of events, activities, and different ways that people might use and could use the spaces, but that that should be managed by the owners or by the operators of the building so that there were always reasons to come up uh, and for the people that live around there on the weekends or in the evenings, there would be things to do. We knew that it would be full of people during the day, uh, but we also wanted it to be full uh, morning, uh, weekends, and night. <clears throat> Mark mentioned the big group of sub-consultants and collaborators that we worked with. I think Atelier 10, Burrow Halfold, uh, Arup are all worth mentioning, as well as Adamson uh, Architects. But together, we, we worked to create, I think, a building and landscape that was trying to work for the neighborhood and create a more sustainable development than what you would have gotten if the building uh, didn't have the park growing and living on it or had a roof uh, that simply shed water and didn't do more. And so we collect water on the roof in the soil and the plants use the storm water. Uh, we also uh, work together with a lot of agencies uh, in, to collect gray water from the sinks in the building uh, and work that uh, into the program of the park, which we'll get into a little bit later. But you can see this was a concept image uh, from early in the design process um, that really talked about seeing you know, a space and a place up there so that this would have an identity on the street level and call people up to it. And that happened in all these different ways, like I said, from outside the building, from inside the building, uh, and then today, uh, from the bus deck level looking up. And specifically, the planting that we chose to surround the skylights was meant to be an event from inside when you look up and call people to it and show three-dimensional space there, but also not grow over the skylight blocking light you know, from the interior, which is another one of the main reasons that the skylights exist, obviously, or perhaps the maintenance here, the architect. Um, this is an image uh, from the streetscape um, from a few months ago, uh, just after opening. And this is a concept image of the plaza in front. Um, and one of our competition concepts was to have uh, a funicular, uh, which became a gondola, like you would go up uh, a mountain when you're going uh, to ski or going up to the snow. This gondola moves up through the plaza to bring people from street level on the plaza up to the park level. And that really isn't the most efficient way to get up and down here, but it's a way that, you know, something moving and something dynamic calls out that there's a special place up top. Um, and that gondola is uh, just about to open uh, and is part of the actual project in the end, um, constructed by the developers of the tower here um, as part of uh, their contribution uh, to the development. Specifically at the park, what we tried to do was create as many routes up to the park from the street level and from the levels of the building as possible. 
And you can see in green, these are all of the ways up from the street level. And some are stairs, some are escalators, and some are elevators. But what we also did as part of the competition was propose that the Salesforce Tower, or the Trans Bay Tower as it was known then, connected by a bridge directly up to a plaza at the center of the park. And so people that are above the level of the park can come down to it and walk out. We worked after we won with city planning in San Francisco to require as part of entitlements for other sites adjacent uh, that those developers needed to set a floor level at the park level and bridge onto it. So ultimately we have a second bridge that's there today. So two bridges come directly onto the park. And uh, in the future, uh, Mark and Kelly Clark Kelly are working on a tower on this site that will have a bridge that comes uh, directly into the park. And so early on there was the question of how will people and the public know that there's a public space there and will it be used? I think we were concerned to try to make that uh, as accessible as possible. What we found uh, since it opened is that it's very popular and uh, in a way uh, we hope not too popular for uh, its own uh, good. <coughs> Mark mentioned that it's not only one park. It's not a park, but it's uh, five and a quarter, I mean five and a half acres in size, but it's not a five and a quarter and a 5.4 acre square. You couldn't have a giant concert and have everyone come uh, and have everyone, it holds about six or 7,000 people total, hear the same concert because they're strung out over four blocks long. And so instead of acting like one park, it's sort of like a series of different neighborhood block-sized parks. At the center is the plaza, which is off of the, uh, the uh, square that's on Mission Street and directly accessible from uh, the Grand Hall, where you can come up an elevator or come up the escalator underneath this skylight, which is the glass paving in the plaza. There's a picnic meadow, there's a restaurant, an amphitheater, there are um, special gardens and specialty gardens that run around the whole outer edge. Um, but as you see, because the buses drove underneath this level and drive around to pick up their passengers, all of the connections, all of those vertical connections, elevators, escalators, stairs, have to exist down the center of the building. And so what we wanted to do was uh, create a park that felt like you were standing on the ground, even though you're standing up on a building. We didn't want it to feel like you're on a roof deck. And the way that we did that was by using topography to roll what would feel like the ground up and down so that we covered the elevator head houses and the stair uh, pop-ups that would come up. And we used the domed glass uh, skylights as part of that topography. So you can see on the left side, this is if it were flat, there were all of these architectural elements that popped up. We made some of them glass. We worked with the, the architects to make some of them glass. We then rolled the ground up over others so that you don't see those. And so that ended up making spaces that were flat in the center around the plaza and the picnic meadow, spaces that were mounded and rolling. And so this then focused the active use uh, performances or gatherings on the plaza, uh, loose play, you know, on the picnic uh, lawn or picnicking. Whereas there were areas for more passive recreation, people could read a book, spend quiet time among plants. And then all around the edges, uh, we focused on the horticultural and botanical uh, program that I mentioned earlier, with specific gardens focused on Mediterranean plants, Australian plants, South African, and then an entire northern garden uh, focused on California native plants. The light column uh, at the Grand Hall has a bamboo grove around it, something that makes the, the, the space with the biggest piece of architecture feel like it's integrated into uh, the landscape up there. But also, again, bamboo is something that lets a lot of light through and doesn't spread over that skylight. So from inside, you get great views uh, up, and you see uh, both the park, but also light makes its way down. One of our other collaborators was Ned Kahn, an environmental artist, and his idea was to use the movement of the buses as uh, the generator of uh, a piece of installation art in the entire uh, park. 
And so he uh, came up with a scheme where buses would trigger jets in the park, and uh, you would see through the jets that were moving at the same rate as the buses, the buses that were moving underneath you on that level. And we worked with him closely in the, con in the competition concept to come up with this idea of a linear fountain on the north side that would use jets to register the buses uh, and that kids could run alongside on the path or even uh, step in uh, when we had warmer days, which we thought at that point were very few and far between uh, in San Francisco. This is just after it was built, but before the park had opened. But about 10 of these jets, that's an actual bus driving below, uh, go up when the buses go, and it moves, like I said, at the rate that the buses move. But when there's many buses, which as it gets used more and more, uh, many buses moving at one time, it's the same amount of water, so all of the jets will get lower, and you'll see many blobs of water moving up and down. <clears throat> From a technical standpoint, though, we had to take what was a concrete sort of tray uh, on top of the building and then create a buildup of soil and, in some cases, lightweight fill, which is foam, to create the landforms. What we tried to do and succeeded in doing is creating as much of a horizontal connected mass of soil as possible so that all of the trees and all of the other plants have as much area to extend their roots and will get good growth on the trees. But we also had to make sure that we have really good drainage and we had to balance that uh, with the structural engineers' weight calculations and requirements. So over the whole park, there's about an average of three feet of soil but the depth ranges from uh, four and a half feet at the deepest places, which is around tree pits, to about 18 inches uh, where we have lawn uh, or other grasses. And so that outer edge of the park, um, I've described what's the social center of the park. That's where all the people go and where they all stay uh, and enjoy themselves. Part of what we planned for the outer edge of the park were these uh, botanical and horticulturally focused gardens that also could work as habitat for native wildlife, um, thinking that we have flying members of our community that could come. In the competition, we had some uh, swimming members that we thought we would need to bring there. Ultimately, the waterways got taken out of the project, um, but we have seen plenty of San Francisco's flying residents coming to the park. This shows the distribution of, um, of uh, gardens, um, and what you can also see is a concept which was for a plant rail that runs next to the path so that people don't go in these habitat gardens, um, but the plants are able to really take over that space. And we have a series of uh, informational uh, plaques that are part of that uh, railing system that talk about the construction of the building, the ecology of the region, uh, other aspects that you'll see in the park from technological and architectural uh, to seismic and geological to uh, horticultural and botanical. The California Garden, as I said, is on the north. A variety of other gardens and other uh, specific plant types are on the south and around the two sides. Um, and this is uh, just the day before opening when everything had grown in. We're looking at the Mediterranean Garden on the right with cork oaks, uh, which have uh, bark that is the source for corks uh, in wine bottles. The desert garden with an agave sign specifically here at the far western end. And at the far eastern end we have the special wetland garden which is designed to receive the gray water from the sinks in the building. Because the building is a public building and has only a number of public restrooms, there are very few uh, few uh, sinks that supply the gray water. So it wouldn't be enough water to water the whole park, but this is a place where water is collected, it's able to be brought up to the park level, polished in the subsurface wetland garden uh, here, and then uh, stored again and reused in the toilets and the um, urinals of those same restrooms. And this is what it looks like uh, today, or at least what it looked like back in uh, November, I think these photos were taken. And so you don't see the water, but you see that it's a wetland planting that you feel like you're in uh, an area you definitely know is a wetland 
uh, zone. I think one last technical bit to talk about was the complexity of the tree uh, sourcing and tree planting. Each of the different colors represents different species of trees, which were hard to come by uh, at the point in time that we were sourcing for the project. Um, but what was important was that we went and procured all of these trees and they were pre-grown uh, at a site in the same zone as our zone in San Francisco. So even though they came from other places around California and some in Oregon, um, they were grown for 18 months at least uh, in our area. And what that was important uh, for was to acclimate palms or other uh, plants that had been grown maybe in a desert that then were being taken to a place where they should do well but we wanted them to acclimate before we heaved them up 70 feet into the air and put them in a place that would be very difficult to change them out uh, or change them if they needed to be changed. Another thing that we worked on together with the design team was uh, working closely on sun exposure and wind studies. And what, there were things that were modeled, things that we knew and things that we designed for, and then there were some surprises on the site. Uh, even though this was very well designed and well thought out. And one of them, which is just an anecdote, is that um, we, had, we accounted for the sun that was blocked by all these buildings and we knew there would be blocks of shade. <clears throat> what we didn't necessarily know at all was how the new architecture that was coming in and the facades of that architecture would reflect the sun. And so what you see here is this is the north side of the, of the transit center up here. Um, and these, that facade shouldn't be getting any direct sun. But what's happening is the sun that's in the south coming from the other side is shining across these palms, projecting their uh, silhouette onto the tower that is on the left side out of this frame. And that's bouncing back and projecting the silhouette onto the facade of the building. And so what we found overall is just that we have a much warmer site, not only because it's up 70 feet and sort of in more sun, but also because it's getting reflected sun from a lot of the buildings that are in the north. So there are times you can be standing there and you end up having two shadows uh, you know, projected on the ground of almost equal weight. And the idea of putting in plants that are subtropical or specifically suited to our area with a focus on the drought tolerance I think was very good thinking about this excess of heat and excess of sun as well as climate change uh, over time. So these are just a couple quick images, one of construction when this is at the sub uh, slab with, um, with the lightweight foam being built up for some of the landform and then the soil was coming in soon after. This is the soil being laid down and you can really get a sense, I think we've been looking at it from above, but you can get a sense of how big it feels, and when you're on the park level, you feel like you're on the ground. This is the palm garden uh, after this moment, uh, and then uh, finished uh, some months later. Still establishing, but um, looking pretty ready for this year. So I think uh, just moving around, it was very, very well used over the first uh, couple of months that it was open with lots of activities and lots of programming. This is the plaza with uh, food and drinks and kiosks that are part of the programming that is uh, run by uh, the operators of the building, um, including a jazz band uh, and also uh, a salsa band later on the plaza. And this is on the glass uh, paving that's in the center of the plaza. And so you can see here uh, the simultaneous uh, experience on the plaza and on the glass during the salsa dance um, and from under the glass in the Grand Hall. Uh, again, really calling people up and it's something that you don't experience every day. So the real flying residents of San Francisco coming in regularly behind the plant rail and uh, a monkey puzzle tree uh, here to puzzle monkeys that they haven't come yet. <laughs> Yeah, another uh, aspect of the uh, park that was unexpected is the weight. Uh, where the station sits used to be part of San Francisco Bay, so it's all landfill. So we had to drive micro piles down to bedrock, which was 300 feet, uh, and 
what we found, but there was still a great deal of uplift that we would have had to have dealt with structurally. But the weight of the park, as it turned out, really helped to compensate for that uplift. So in many ways, the park helped us to economize our structural system and frankly helped us to afford the park. Ultimately. And it was a great argument for having the park. Uh, and that gets back to some things we talked about at lunch. Uh, any of these large projects, we found that to really be successful, we as designers have to focus in on those key issues that are essential for the project to be successful and not fight every design battle, everything we wish to happen at every stage. And that we wanted to focus on certain elements instead and, and really be steadfast on those so that we could weather the years of assault that were ahead of us in terms of the client group, the politics, the economy, uh, so that over that long time span, we never let, 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 let our focus become dissolved in some manner. And the park was one of those key factors, one of those key places that we really wanted to always hold on to no matter what. There were constant, constant assaults on that park over time uh, in terms of cost and maintenance and so forth. You can imagine uh, how some people might think this was quite an extravagance. The other key element was the enclosure of the center itself. It's actually legally called a, an awning by code. But uh, what we wanted to do is to create a very porous, sculptural, friendly enclosure for this bus station. It's essentially a bus station above that. And as I mentioned, the Port Authority bus station in New York, here again, was a learning experience. Um, and also it also, wanted, it also wanted to be breathable because we were using not only natural ventilation, but we needed to exhaust the bus stuff bus deck part. So this had to be a breathing element uh, and open to the air. And so we came up with this idea of a superstructure that would hold up the bus deck and also hold up these compound curves uh, that would run the entire length and give the building scale and character. Uh, and we enlisted the help, oops, the help of Sir Roger Penrose. He's a mathematician out of Oxford. He is a colleague of Stephen Hawking's. He came to our attention several years before the station because he was developing interesting patterns, non-repeating patterns that he was experimenting with. And he was doing them on flat surfaces. Uh, and we found them very intriguing. We thought also as part of the narrative of this station, given that it was in San Francisco, the high-tech companies, all of that, that the skin needed to have a certain complexity, a certain interest. It couldn't be a one-liner. I mean, we could have done perforated dots and perforated squares, you know, all the things that we all see so much. We wanted to go beyond that. So we contacted Roger, and he was more than happy to collaborate with us. Of course, as I said, he had developed all of these on a flat plane. We wanted to do it on a compound curve. And long story short, we spent probably a year trying to translate his geometries into a workable metal skin in which his panels uh, and his pattern became knockouts of these diamond shapes. And that's, that was the final pattern that we developed for the station. It had to be a scale that was readable from a distance uh, and open enough that the, that the building could breathe, as I mentioned, and also we chose to go to a very light color uh, to enhance its friendliness and also enhance the contrast within the pattern itself. This is one of Roger's early experiments. And so this is the real thing. And it gave us also this delightful transparency, a lot that we couldn't have calculated beforehand, but it has turned out to be such a wonderful translucent uh, and sort of diaphanous kind of container for the bus station that it has really uh, given it real character. And at night, we have lived actually behind the skin, the superstructure, just the superstructure. 
Uh, and so this thing glows at night without being a, a hindrance uh, from a light pollution point of view. Um, and, but the real light is really at the base of the building where we have retail and restaurants. Uh, and of course, the Grand Hall as well, and the various passageways I mentioned that give this building this real connection to the neighborhoods and allow people to pass through. Another detail of the project, which um, is a, an idea that we have pursued in a number of the projects we've done, uh, particularly at Washington National Airport that I was also involved with, is the idea of collaborating with an artist from the beginning of the design process. Not just bringing them in at the end and putting a piece of sculpture in the plaza, but really integrating art into the building as a method of, once again, trying to create a sense of place and also connecting the building to its context. And so we collaborated with uh, an artist named Julie Chang. She had never worked in Terrazzo before. She had done the smaller scale work. But she, at this time, was very fascinated by the Victorian uh, decorative arts that were very, part, very much a big part of uh, San Francisco uh, architecture for a period. And what she's done is she's taken those, those, uh, those patterns and enlarged them, amplified them, looked at it a little bit more carefully and made some adjustments. But uh, this is the floor of the Grand Hall, uh, done in an epoxy terrazzo manner. Uh, I, I mentioned epoxy because that allows us to get these bright, saturated colors, which are so important to the ultimate success of this. And you can see the level of detail that we were able to achieve um, in the Toronto. We also collaborated with Jenny Holster, uh, who was a, a more world-renowned artist um, who uh, uses LED uh, signage, moving signage. Uh, to, uh, to artful means. Uh, she tends to take literature and sayings and anything she can gather up to make these signs. They move, they change. Uh, and we thought putting her inside the, uh, uh, the light well of the Grand Hall was the perfect place uh, because the escalators move through this space. It would be an opportunity to entertain people, frankly as they move up and down. And she, she drew from literature in the San Francisco area, like John Steinbeck, quotes, and so forth. And that gets changed over time and is sort of an ever-changing exhibit, which is quite fantastic. And here you can see uh, just an animation of that space and the Grand Hall. Just to show you the quality of the space, this is the way one would move through the space, up to the park, up to the uh, bus level, and the way that people would get engaged in the artwork and the way that it's integrated into the floor. So just uh, showing some additional uh, shots of the park. Uh, this is the, uh, the amphitheater that uh, Adam spoke of before at the far western end. And you can see the central hall in the distance here. And this is the uh, opening day. Uh, we had an incredible audience uh, and, and, and collection of people. Uh, in fact, there were so many people, there was a lot of damage. And Adam uh, <laughs> alluded to that. It's become so popular that it's been kind of overrun. Um, so that's going to have to be managed a little bit better. And you're looking directly straight down, and you're looking at the, the glass floor that uh, Adam showed as well as the central skyline. And this is the eastern end of the, uh, of the station, showing the skin and how it meets the uh, platform of the uh, roof, roof deck. Uh, all of that has been articulated carefully to really separate it out, give it scale, um, and make it as friendly as possible to the streetscape. But ultimately, after we got through all the technical issues, the functional issues, we wanted this thing to be good. Uh, at some point, you need to step back and we need to think about how, these, how this will 
appear on the street, how people will engage in it, what will it look like. Um, and so we are very intent on creating a really iconic, beautiful, memorable station that would be memorable as timeless as possible. And here are just some details of the skin. You can see the attachments. See, it's a space frame that holds up the, uh, the actual awning and is actually outboard of the roof top part. And then from within the bus deck itself, we didn't want this bus deck to be your traditional dark, dingy space. Uh, there's been money and design talent put into the ceiling skylights, the, the, the looking through the awning is extremely beautiful. A real high quality level of finishes to really make this a place where people want to stay. And that carries all the way down into the, into the train box as well. And we're also looking to bring natural light as far down as we could. This is, the, this is the, the end of the light column coming through to the lower level and actually it penetrates even further uh, down into the actual train box, which has not been built yet, but eventually will be. And here's a good shot of the skin and what that looks like from the inside out. So let me talk a little bit about the tower. Uh, not a small object, 1.4 million square feet, 62 stories, 1,070 feet tall. Um, re-establishing the skyline, as I mentioned, of, of San Francisco. Uh, initially, uh, Salesforce was not on the horizon. It was going to be a multi-tenant building. Uh, but we, we were obviously very aware that this was going to become the new icon. Uh, this was going to be the postcard of San Francisco for many years to come. So we wanted to create a building that one had an incredibly handsome um, profile. Of course, it had to do all the usual things buildings of this type have to do in terms of these steps, uh, square footed floors, tight cores, and so forth. But we also wanted to, for, for sure, make sure the building met the ground in a soft and friendly way as possible. We also didn't want it to be a one-liner in terms of its curtain wall and its articulation. So it's a building that is highly crafted in terms of its curtain wall. It's a wall that allows 100% fresh air uh, movement through it. It has curved glass insulated units on the corners. And the lobby itself is a very open, transparent lobby, uh, which has become the, the real, real lobby for Salesforce. And here you can see that on Mission Street. And it's really a credit to also the San Francisco Planning Department, which has been forcing all the architects to follow this kind of approach in terms of lobbies that not only uh, house the usual information desk, but also retail. And here you get a sense of the articulation of the tower, uh, some sun shading involved as well, uh, given the climate and the fresh air component that I mentioned. And you can see here the curved glass corners, which are extremely important to the overall kind of uh, slenderness of this tower. I mean, we had to deal with a tower that was initially very bulky. So this as a way, as a device, to help slim the tower, uh, and, and, it's, and it's simply just beautiful in the sunlight. It really does provide a quite memorable tower. And here you can see it relative to the Bay Bridge and Oakland in the distance. It has a lid top, which I'll show you in a minute. Here's just a cross section of the, uh, of the typical floor. Uh, it is now, as you know, the, the headquarters for Salesforce. Uh, most of the offices are very much open offices. They're also open on the floors, which uh, the CEO, Mark Benioff, um, uh, has in all his buildings. And they're essentially a, a super amenity floor. Ohana is family in Hawaii. And he sees these as very instrumental in bringing together his, 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 his people in a collaborative fashion. And of course, with this building being the tallest building in town, the sights and the, uh, the view are really quite considerable, as you can see here. And then, of course, it has the personality of night. 
it's lit from the inside. It actually has um, the ability to uh, move. It has a cloud scene, as you see here. It also has dancing figures that it can project. And so it's a, it's a very active and like, dynamic space um, to give this tower even a great personality at night. And, and just to end, uh, end the presentation, uh, just show you the building in various lights. Uh, San Francisco is very unique in its climate and its clouds and its fog. And uh, the tower transforms over time, much of which you can't anticipate, but you hope that the, the tower will catch the beauty of the sky and the nature of the atmosphere in the city. That's it. <laughs> if you want to ask some questions, we'd be happy to answer some. I know we didn't cover it. <laughs> Let's just answer one. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry? It's the Salesforce Tower. First, there was the, the micro, from, from the bottom up, first there was the microplast. And there are hundreds of those that reach down to bedrock. Because the, the ground that we're on, in a seismic, uh, at a seismic moment, that ground will really turn to jello. That's how it's been described to me. Uh, so the building has to have that anchor. And then at the ground level, we have a, a huge mat slab, which then above that is a it's a central moment frame that really creates the backbone for the building over its entire life. And that's broken into three segments with a healthy expansion joint between each one. And that's it. And then the weight of the park gives us stability as well during those kinds of events. I mean, they didn't ask for a rooftop park. Right. Uh, we gave it to them. Um, one of our competitors had a smaller version of the rooftop park. Uh, one did not, uh, of the three finals. But um, no, they, um, I think they were looking for innovation, uh, and looking for some fresh ideas. Uh, and even the, the station that we showed at the competition level was actually, the awning was a glass. On it. it wasn't perforated metal. That fell away once we started thinking seriously about maintenance, security, um, and cost. And frankly, it's one of those happy changes for us. Uh, honestly, we're, we are actually glad we moved on to the metal. We think that's a stronger idea, um, and it's much more maintainable and sustainable. Yes, sir. <laughs> you have to bring that up. <laughs> there, um, the good news is it's not a design flaw. What he's talking about, uh, it was discovered when they were putting some fireproofing on some of the steel uh, on the underside of the station in one of the areas crossing over the streets. Uh, this gentleman was putting on the fireproofing and he noticed that there was some cracking at the beams. And he was smart enough and wise enough to actually bring it to somebody's attention before he sprayed the fire for me. Um, and so that alerted everybody. Uh, the way that it's been explained to me is that it's, it's not a design flaw, it is a fabrication issue. And what happened was that when you weld two pieces of steel together, you need to preheat 
both pieces of steel to a certain temperature. If you don't do that, a piece of steel that's not properly uh, tempered goes fragile and brittle. And that's what happened. And it's only happened in that one place. However, what they're going to do is they're going to replate all those joints um, to make sure that it's as safe as can be. Of course, being a public building, it's going to take a little time. It's going to go through a process. Uh, and they're going to you know, do it 110% to make sure it's safe. And it will reopen in July. But I think the good news about that is that the plants that got trampled on the first day because we opened quickly <laughs> have had a chance to really establish, and so we're ready for crowds. <laughs> so, any other questions? No, it hasn't. It wasn't open long enough for us to really do that. Um, what were the plans for that, and in terms of any metrics on sustainability? Well, the, the intention is that it will be uh, there will be a post mortem on everything like that. Uh, the I think we need to open all the retail. I mean, the building has to really fully open, which even even in July it won't be fully open in terms of all the retail and all the other operational parts of the station. So I think that will have to happen first. And then uh, the TJPA will, will do their evaluation. I think what, what had been happening over the months that it was open was that there were uh, counts, you know, visitor number counts at all different times of the day as a regular part of the park uh, programming and operations. And that was being tracked for the days, you know, that and, and weeks and months that it was open. Um, but it was something that we were eager to watch, you know, and see how many people engaged in activities and programming that was specifically programmed, and how many people were just coming up, uh, you know, for other activities and things. And all of that, as well as the drainage and everything else, uh, will be tracked in a way that's much more exhausted than other projects because you're not able to on other projects that aren't as, uh, you know, separated from other systems in a certain way. Plus, of course, the train box itself is not open yet, so that's also down the line probably a bit. Um, so, I were hopeful for that, but that's a question of California's recent financial issues. You know, who knows what's going to happen, but the box is there. Uh, we're now looking at uh, Tesla's looking at the box in a temporary fashion to park cars and to charge cars. But, so we'll find a use for it, but hopefully it will be a eventually train. Yes. Anybody? Yes, sir. Um, you talked to Well, that, that falls to the San Francisco City Planning Department to a large degree, if I understand the question. Um, and Adam can speak to this because this is his home town, more or less. Uh, but you know, San Francisco in general is going through a bit of a crisis in terms of development in general. Uh, and they're going to have to really figure out how they what really want to proceed. So many uh, sort of low-income areas are being developed now. And, trans and, and pushing people out that were traditionally there before. And some of the, the funkiness that is part of San Francisco's charm is also getting pushed out because of this rush to development, because of all the companies moving in. So how that ultimately gets managed, I think, uh, ultimately has to come from the city. Um, we as architects are not always in a position to dictate that. Um, so. But it, it is an issue, particularly in San Francisco, since it's such a boom. Uh, that may not last forever. It will subside, it won't be as much of an issue as it is now. But uh, housing is a big issue in terms of cost of housing. Um, 
I know there, there's, there's a lot of subsidies going on uh, in, in the trade-off between development and uh, low-cost housing, but is it enough? Probably not, given the number of people who are getting transplaced. It's kind of funny where you provide this great public space. I know. But it is, it is providing new residential units, it's providing a, a larger economy for San Francisco. All of that eventually makes a difference, a positive difference. Um, how it's actually manipulated and parsed out um, is a bigger story. Answering your second question, yes, I hope so. Um, as far as the openness, is it still 18 hours? Is that the yes, plan? 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. is the, the operating hours that, they, that they're taking up there. And uh, that was the third and the second. What was the first again? <laughs> uh, the first one was the 24 hour one. The second one was the overpopulation. Uh, oh, yeah. On, on that, um, it's interesting when you work on a collaborative project with with architects and it's entirely on uh, a piece of architecture and then it's a question about what codes you know get applied and how do people apply codes to different places um, ultimately there's a maximum number of people we're allowed to have on the park because of exiting uh, down the stairs um, it's about it's between six and seven thousand people that um, can be on the park um, but through the design of the park itself, with the plant rail, with densely vegetated areas versus paved areas versus, you know, uh, areas with lawn, the total number of people that can spend time there should fit the number that, um, that you know, is able to be up there. What happened on uh, the opening day, they, they were, I think, so worried that maybe enough people wouldn't come, that it was publicized in ways on uh, social media and all these different ways, that many more than <coughs> 7,000 people came to go up there. And the whole building was filled uh, beyond capacity for the park, um, so they did begin to time people. But in a normal day, and this was where things were tracked after that opening weekend, uh, we never reached maximum, but it was always quite populated and full at all times of the day. Uh, but never approaching the maximum number. Yes. Um, I'd like to know about the bus station interfaces with other forms of transportation. Um, you know, uh, one thing with taxis and private cars and uh, of course Ubers and so forth. Is there a well, well we have we have taxi lanes on the north side uh, of the station. Um, there's also a, a surface lake with BART to the north of us. We don't have an underground lake yet. That's a possibility in the future. Um, there's also the idea of even a further bus station further east uh, to expand. Uh, and then, you know, personal vehicles we, is, is a fairly low element within this mix as designed. Uh, there are drop off points, kiss and ride areas, but that doesn't seem to be the, the pattern that's going to happen. It's mostly um, through BART through walking to the site from within the city. And taxis and taxis and Lyft and Uber and all that. Yes. Uh, you talked about your high speed rail, this hyper loop one. Can you say? I don't know what it's going to be, ultimately. Um, it's, it's probably 10 years off. And the technology will be different by the time we get there. But it's supposed to be the state of the art. And it's to cut the trip down from Los Angeles to San Francisco to almost what it is right now as a plane ride. So, yes, sir. Can you talk about the, uh, the collaborative effort? So, back and forth thing? Yeah, was it a linear process? Somebody did something, and somebody did something after that? Or how did it no, it's, it's not. It's linear sometimes, but it's not always. 
Um, I'll, I'll say something, you can say something then. But I, you know, I think both offices have always uh, had a, a design process that was collaborative, so it's not something that we give a second thought to. Um, I think it's, it's a give and take. You sit in a room and you throw ideas around, and uh, we, we have enough mutual respect, which is a very key thing, by the way, uh, that, it, that it happens. And egos are kind of left at the, uh, at the door. Uh, and you just come up with the best ideas you can. And I think that continued all the way through the process. And it certainly happened between our two offices, but also the engineers as well. Uh, and you know, we selected a team of people that we knew were collaborative in nature. Not everybody is. So it's also selecting the right people to associate with who want to have that kind of dialogue. And are looking uh, to do something a little bit new, a little bit out of the box. Uh, you know, maybe not bleeding edge, but cutting edge. Uh, I think that's that's how that really starts to set up. Um, and um, you know, Caesar, you know, has you know, his legacy is the Saturday years, and that was very much the way Saturday did it. That's the way Caesar did it. That's what Caesar taught us to do, and now we're all doing it as well. So I mean, it's uh, as I said, it's a natural part of our process. I think sometimes it's like a a well-coached soccer game with the ball passing clearly back and forth. And then sometimes it becomes like my five-year-old kid's team with like everyone at the ball and it goes out. But um, I think it's not just the collaborators on the design team. There is the owner, there are the uh, codes and the, and the restrictions and requirements. There's VE and budget. You know, and all of those things push this around, you know, back and forth with us responding to that and our teams responding to that as, at the same time as each of our teams separately and together we're driving some things. So I think it's it's a mix, you know, in a project. Yeah, I think it's an openness uh, and it's about listening and listening carefully. And I know this sounds a little bit rogue. I mean, it really, it's really basic. And it's, and in, in the non-collaborative situations we found ourselves in, those are the things that aren't happening. And so we really need to focus on those issues. Yes, sir. How far out of their comfort zone did you push the developer or financial part? Uh, well, there was the station and then there was the tower. Um, the tower was a, you know, a developer. Right. The developer was Heinz. Uh, the good news there is Heinz has the reputation of doing quality architecture. That's not to say they don't want to make money on their buildings. Um, so there was uh, a lot of uh, back and forth. I mentioned the, the curved glass corners, for instance. That was a battle in itself. Uh, getting the building to be tall was a battle in itself. Um, but they, they're very good at ultimately understanding what we want, we try to understand what they need, and we find a middle ground. And that's why we've worked with Heinz on so many projects. In fact, the other project that uh, I'm working on, Parcel F, uh, which is a big use project with uh, Salesforce once again, and hotel and residential tower, is with Heinz. I think it's worth noting that Heinz was part of the competition team. Oh, they were, yeah. That we had a It was a developer, developer there. Or designer team. As far as the station goes, um, we had a very good um, head of the DJPA who she was responsible for getting this project before, long before we came on board to actually have it. Very determined, uh, very skilled person within the political scene in San Francisco. Um, she had a daunting task. She uh, always supported us. We had budget issues. We had to deal with that. Uh, it wasn't always easy. I'm not trying to uh, say this was easy by any means, but it was key to have somebody in her position that was actually uh, catching the spirit of what we wanted, wanted to do. And that made it a whole lot easier. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Was there, what was the biggest heartache? The heartache? Was there any heartache? Oh, it was controlling the costs. You know, I mentioned we went through these economic cycles, you know, 
and especially the 2008-2007, that zone, that was extremely difficult. And then San Francisco came back in a hurry, with a big boom, and the cost of everything skyrocketed. You know, I mean, we're talking like 25, 30% more for steel. And you go, oh my God, what are we gonna do now? And um, so we had just months and months of that kind of anxiety. How to handle the budget, how to parse it out, how to phase it, how to find a new way to do it, construct it that was less expensive, going back and rebidding it, um, all sorts of things. Plus we had a Made in America clause that we had to adhere to. That also bound us up a little bit. Um, so you know, the, uh, the market was a, was a problem. But things worked themselves out. Um, it's one good thing about a project that goes on this long. Usually something changes eventually. Um, and uh, you're able to find new money. Uh, the board brought in new money to, to compensate for what was going on in the marketplace. Um, so, and I should say the board was, was supportive as well. I mean, that was another key component of this uh, as we move forward. But, uh, you know, the, the design part was easy. <laughs> it was the, the politics and the budgeting uh, that really was the challenge here. And, and just sticking with it over that long period. I mean, it is a game of attrition, as we've talked about in the studios. Um, you want to be the last person standing as a designer so that you can defend it and uh, protect it all the way through. And so you have to be clever, you have to really be, you have to really work uh, at making sure that your, your dream comes true and finding ways to do that. And that means working through the system, working through the politics, um, it's not always what we were all trained to do and we all want to do, but it's an essential part of the design process, especially for these large public projects. I think that's, there's one thing to say about an integrated design also related to that. I mean, definitely for us, it was the same heartache because landscape, you know, even when you work for the firm that I work for and, uh, you know, that, that has a history and has a success uh, sort of behind it, it doesn't mean that you get to the you know, construction of a project and there's funding left to landscape, <clears throat> you know, every time. And that happens when it's around the building or next to something, but it definitely happens when it's on the top of the building. And that was something that came up over and over again um, right after we got the project uh, and we went through sort of the first phase, schematic design, something like that, or design uh, validation, I think, of the concept. The question came up, not how much does the park cost because the developer uh, team member also was supportive you know, of the park as being part of the, the uh, final design, but could the building be less expensive if the structure didn't need to hold up as much soil as we were saying it needed to, to have a park? And in schematic design, the structural engineers, Thornton Tomasetti, worked through this and said ultimately because of the security requirements of this building and because of the seismic requirements of this building the, and the structural system that they designed, it all would have to be roughly the same cost if you didn't have the park. And as Mark talked about that, so that was early in the design. And then later down the road, it was again, whoa, everything costs a lot more because the economy has gone up and now contractors are charging 30% more for what we had budgeted you know, years ago, something different. And at that point, it again became, okay, what if we just didn't do the park? You know, we're already digging it and building the bottom levels, how about we just don't do that? But it ended up uh, being an integral part of the structural design where the top of the building needed to weigh as much as had been allowed for the park to weigh. So if you didn't build the park, you'd need to fill it all with concrete or fill it all with soil and not get any other uses out of it. So I think it ended up that things that were integrated design ideas for, for goodness sake ended up being integrated design ideas that um, helped the battleship get through. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, one other rough spot that we had was that the director, she went to a risk and vulnerability uh, conference in New York 
um, at ground zero at one point, and she had all these security experts talking to her. And uh, this is not to belittle it, but it, it scared her to death. And she came back to San Francisco wanting to be assured that this station could withstand a nuclear attack, practically. <laughs> Um, and we spent close to a year going through a uh, risk and vulnerability assessment uh, that added cost to the building. It also delayed the building to another business cycle, and this is when the cost went skyrocketing. If we had built the building a year earlier, it would have been X number of millions less. So, uh, and so, and then, and then just the process of assessing how, how, what kind of security approach do you take on a building? Is it a place of refuge? What kind of bombs, what kind of situations are you trying to plan for and defend for? And it is an endless discussion, let me tell you. It is an endless discussion and very hard to get your hands around. And you can't solve every problem, so which problems are you going to try to solve? And what types of, why would this facility be vulnerable and coming through it on that? So that was another difficult and intense period that had a cost implication and potentially a, a design implication as well. Um, so luckily all of that kind of got settled and the design stayed intact and we were able to move on. But you have these, uh, these moments of high anxiety and said that uh, this make it interesting. Yes? seen a number of projects in Europe that have copied it. Uh, I, no, I think it will. It'll catch on. Um, and, and, you know, and we can't claim absolute authorship on it either. I mean, it's been done. The High Line was a great inspiration for us. I mean, so it's, it's one of those things that will evolve and will become different uh, as it gets get used more. But I, I think its benefit has certainly been shown in so many different locations and particularly at Transmet. So I, I see a great future for this kind of um, community element and this kind of amenity to give back to the cities. And I think it's, it's a, obviously it's a much more sustainable idea. It makes a lot of sense. We can, and the economics work, even more importantly, for all the naysayers, the economics work. Yes. I don't know, and you want to speak to that? The logistics of getting it, it the was, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a challenge for the contractor. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that was one thing that um, ended up being a key to uh, the contractor, the landscape contractor that won the bid uh, with the lowest bid, actually, um, was about figuring out ways to share cranes with adjacent um, constructions and adjacent towers uh, and a schedule to work out with them where they were able to lift uh, not only the soil but also the trees because the trees were grown above grade. Here you dig them you know, out of the ground. Um, some of them were dug out of the ground but then they were boxed and in California most of the trees get boxed. Some of the boxes were 108 inches uh, in their size and so those trees had to be delivered from uh, the location a couple, an hour away or 45 minutes away into the city. So that had to be a nighttime delivery with a nighttime craning. So what the contractor did was they would uh, crane up basically um, super bags of soil every night. They would set them up all around the path. We have a continuous path that runs a uh, quarter mile each way, so a half mile path. So half of the park would be, uh, the path would have giant bags of soil set up on it every night. Then during the day, they would move the soil down the other half of the path every day, ready for upload every night. They also lifted up containers, like uh, container truck, 18-wheeler uh, containers, or reefer container size, 
um, they would lift the whole one up and set it uh, in the amphitheater area, which would be full of the plants, the smaller plants. Those would come off during the day. In the evening, that would go down, and then another one that was made ready would go up. But it was trying to do this all related to traffic and uh, other uses, you know, in the area downtown. So hard, but not our responsibility. <laughs> Yes, sir. Can you go back and change something several things? Oh, actually. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, if, if we could, it would have been nice to afford more of the light columns that are shown here in the Grand Hall. The original competition had a series of those along the entire length. They were smaller, but they were more of them. Um, Knowing how well the larger, grander one we did uh, succeeded, uh, it would have been wonderful to have a few more of those. Uh, but you know what? Nobody else knows that but now you um, and some people on the team, and no one's going to know the difference. But you know, it's just one of those things that you sacrifice. Um, once again, getting back to the priorities. We had to play all these games about where money's go. And where we wanted the money to go was into the park and into the honor. We thought those were the things that were going to distinguish this building and give it a timeless quality to it. Um, and I didn't talk a lot about timelessness, but we spent a lot of time on that. Work. And what did we want to do to create a building that would have that quality uh, and would have lasting power? We didn't want this to be the building with the, you know, the fad of the moment and had to have something much more substantial. That kind of timelessness starts with the functionality and, and working at it economically as well as physically and engineering-wise. But uh, the idea of the shaping, the coloration, the beauty of it, as well as the tower, were also a very key thing. And so to achieve that, we were able to, we were you know, willing to subtract certain things for the ultimate goal. Keep our eye on the ball. That was the key. Just. Was the tower and the park built simultaneously, one after another? Well, the station was built first. It's just, well, it was, they were going simultaneously at one point, but the, the tower came a little bit later. Geothermal, so it was key for that. Um, so that's the that, that's the biggest sort of renewable source. And I think that was one thing that came up even early uh, in the competition, and then repeatedly through design of the building was the use of natural light as much as possible and natural ventilation. And the ventilation, no air conditioning, was something that uh, the the architectural and engineering part of the design team really had to convince the owner of, um, not because we use air conditioning very often in San Francisco, but just uh, many explanations about what, how you feel human comfort and how, you feel, how humans uh, are comfortable if they have a breeze, even if it's a little bit warmer and if the humidity is uh, moderate. I mean, and so then mapping those kind of human comfort uh, requirements on the natural uh, climate of San Francisco and then the way that air moves through the building based on uh, wind ended up uh, allowing for a pretty much naturally ventilated uh, building. The client was still nervous with that and we still had to put, uh, and this is an actual product, we had to put big ass fans <laughs> on the bus deck level. And these are big fans. Uh, but that's the brand name. Uh, so they have to say. <laughs> and that allowed, that gave them a belt and suspenders kind of comfort uh, in, in case the natural ventilation didn't work, even though we, we had every expert we could get 
uh, to explain it to them, but you know, they couldn't quite receive it. So uh, you find yourself in those kind of situations too. Yes. Fun fact for this big ass band that made your monkey. Sorry? This fun fact for this big ass band that made your fashion here monkey. Oh, I know that. Is that fun fact? <laughs> we should have done that. Oh, so, so you're very familiar with that. <laughs> When we first discovered it, we couldn't believe that was the name. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, how many we going to present this? <laughs> See, th those have been brought up to me in Singapore as a possible band to use, and I thought it was some Singaporean slang in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yes? and management are a necessity, but the trees should be able to grow and mature for close to 50 years. Uh, the 50 to 100, I think there would need to be significant changeover or some removal on trees. Um, but overall, the systems that we've worked out together with the architecture is aiming at that kind of lifestyle. So um, that's not a time frame that we were not thinking about. Um, and I think, you know, in general, the circuit um, path that runs around the hall also means that we can accept other paths in, in different places. Um, and I think that's been something that has been interesting, that we did a design competition that proposed a design that wasn't necessarily described in the brief. We got selected as the, as the winner, but then once that design became um, sort of the uh, thing to work around in the city. City planning reacted to that and adjusted and changed some of the requirements like I was mentioning uh, around it. And so I think watching something that's a physical proposal affect policy and then policy affect the next physical proposal has been a really interesting thing and I think that's sort of the organic way that the park might change over time also uh, with what happens around. And there's a real possibility to get it extended or not. To get longer. If they needed more bus berths. But you know, you don't know, I mean, are we going to even have buses in the future? Or how will buses be in the future? I mean, there was a whole lot of unknowns that we couldn't really be time for. But you know, as far as the bus deck is concerned, it can be elongated and completed. There's been talk about it already being elongated. The park, I guess, could go along with it. Uh, as far as the uh, the inside of the uh, transit center is essentially a shell, and it can go through whatever retail over um, redos that it will um, obviously will have to go through in the years to come. So hopefully the Grand Hall will stay as the kind of fixed point, but all that retail uh, is all flexible space that can be carved and programmed in any number of other ways. Let's, maybe you can ask that uh, personally, but um, let's uh, thank our guests one more time. <laughs>